Good evening, everyone. Uh, going to call to order the uh, June 1st, uh, 2022 meeting of the Fitchburg Conservation Commission. I now call this meeting to order. Please be advised FATV is conducting an audio and video recording of this meeting for public broadcast. I ask that if anyone else in our audience who is recording this meeting to please identify themselves for the record now by stating uh, their name and their address. At this time, I'd ask that all electronic devices please be placed in silent mode for the duration of the meeting. Uh, at this time, the Conservation Commission may choose to conduct the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, do folks feel like uh, conducting the Pledge of Allegiance this evening? That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Ready? Ready. Uh, to, to the flag, flag of the United States, States of America, America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation, God, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and, justice and justice for all. Thanks, folks. Uh, I'm going to conduct a roll call of the present <coughs> members of our Conservation Commission. Uh, pres uh, Commissioner Helene? I'm here. Commissioner Baker? Here. Commissioner Donnelly? Here. Commissioner Christensen? Here. How are we doing? <clears throat> and yourself? Uh, yeah, Commissioner Bro, uh, here. Uh, Associate uh, Joyce. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't know if we included uh, our associate member, uh, Joyce. And yeah, thank she's, you. She's here this evening with us. <clears throat> uh, okay. If your body has, uh, if the Conservation Commission is public comment by rule or by discretion, the public had been, uh, pardon me, I'm just thrown into this rule. I don't think I have to read this part. Uh, like, do I just motion to adjourn the minutes of last month at this point? Um, well, there aren't, there aren't minutes from the last two quite, quite ready yet. A little bit of finishing up to do on the minutes. Okay. So we don't have any to approve. Oh, okay. All right. So uh, we just go into the first uh, hearing, I guess? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think like you, uh, so for those who are out there in the public, uh, if you're looking at the scheduled hearings for this evening, we'll be uh, starting on the second uh, that are listed. Um, the first had requested an extension into next month. But. Well, we could, we could um, there was a, an email that I printed out from um, the first applicant. Maybe that'll help explain things. I think I slid it over to you gotcha. earlier. Right here. Oh, uh, yeah, oh what's the explanation. It? Oh, yeah, here. here it is. I, 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 here. So this is from um, GFI Partners, who is the applicant for the zero um, Crawford Street warehouse building. Um, um, now on behalf of Fitchburg Land Property Owner LLC, I hereby request a continuance of the June 1st Fitchburg Conservation Commission public meeting regarding our NOI filing for Airport Road and Crawford Street. Uh, we would like to uh, we would like to have additional time to discuss access and other outstanding concerns with city departments. And um, I think we talked about it. I might have touched on it at the site walk on, on the 17th of May a bit, but there's been discussion about, if at all possible, to have an alternative means of access from the Amazon uh, property that's under construction now, the old Simon Saw on Intervale Road, out to Crawford Street, and it would cross this airport pit property. So they're still looking, out, uh, looking at that, handling an engineering. The engineer is... Uh, still working at alternatives there. So they did just request additional time and want to continue to the July, Wednesday, July 6th meeting. So Correction, actually, I think I had said June, so today's June 1st, so the July meeting. So maybe a motion to continue? Yeah, can I get a motion to continue that into July? Uh, so moved. Second. Tim Smith, uh, offered uh, to uh, start an order of conditions on the project. Uh, we ought to acknowledge his offer and you know, make a decision, decide not to accept it, uh, and to wait for them to finish up. What would be appropriate? 
Well, maybe it might be, a, and thank you, Mike, because um, I, I, I read it and forwarded it to the parties that be, but then immediately forgot that that happened. Um, maybe it would be good just because the um, hearing hasn't been continued, it hasn't been a vote yet. Let me just read from Tim's email quickly here. So folks, I mean, we'll talk about it again in July, but okay, his thoughts on this agenda item. Um, Zero Crawford Street, um, a thorough, well-prepared notice of intent. Project will result in an improvement in the riverfront area. While I understand that planting and mowing a lawn in the area adjacent to the river will help control invasives and provide a decrease in impervious area, some native tree or shrub planting should be considered to contribute to the wildlife interest per the Wetlands Protection Act and further stabilize the area near the riverbank to prevent storm damage which is another interest in the, in the act. Drainage improvements and riverfront restoration should be scheduled before warehouse construction. Let me know if you want to prepare a draft order of conditions for the commission's next meeting or, or special meeting. Might I suggest that Tim uh, start on an order of conditions, draft if you will, and any of the commission members that would like to contribute to that draft, consult with Tim individually. I'm okay with that strategy. Is uh, that a motion, Mike? Sure sounds like uh, it. it sh sure, and, and to continue, that would be a motion and to continue the hearing. Based on Tim's draftings. I, I would second that. Okay, uh, do the roll call. Please. Commissioner Helene? Aye. Commissioner Baker? Aye. Commissioner Donnelly? Aye. Commissioner Christensen? Aye. Commissioner Bro, aye. Can that, that passes. <clears throat> okay. All right. Uh, second on our docket tonight is notice in, of intent, Fitchburg DPW repairs to Arbor Way retaining wall. Um, do we have anyone here from the public? That um, there no. is. Let's see. For anyone, that I guess, yeah. Uh, Weston and Sampson. Anyone in our chat room? Well, the, the, uh, the other attendees, um, sorry, I'm skipping over to hey, that. It's okay. Uh, Matt Kinlan, I'm sorry, is that with um, Gail? I can't remember whether you're for the uh, Arbor Way or which city project. I think that that's for Parkerfield. Hey, know. Mike, this is Nick Erickson here. Um, I, I think I'm the only person on for the Arbor Way project. Um, we didn't have Weston Sampson attend tonight just because, um, well, we felt like we could we could cover it. Um, you know, they, they made their presentation last week, but I'd be happy to um, go over any questions that came up during the site walk. I know Tim Smith had expressed some concerns about um, just the, the volume or square footage rather of, of um, impacts to the wetlands. Um, so I, my, my plan was to kind of walk through the alternatives that we looked at um, and again, answer any of your questions. Sure, Nick, we'd like to hear that. Okay, um, so as you know, Arbor Way is a, a dead end cul-de-sac um, with two businesses at the end. So it's one way in, one way out for both those businesses. Um, so we keep that in mind as I kind of walk through the alternatives. So the the um, Arbor Way itself is supported by two um, Versalock retaining wall, uh, Versalock block retaining walls, one on either side of the road. Um, the walls have started to fail. They've been failing since about 2014. We've gone through various stages of diagnosing and coming up with engineering solutions to fix those repairs or to repair those, those issues. Um, and the wall just kind of kept deteriorating further in the, the time span that we, we kept trying to plan and budget for, for the repairs. Um, so here we are now, we're looking at, you know, a solution to address problems now on, on both sides, um, kind of at, at the beginning and the ends of both sides of the walls. Um, so in order to, so I guess the, the first action that we evaluated is the, the no action alternative. Um, and we could just continue to let these, these walls crumble to the point that the road needs to be closed because it's unsafe for vehicular traffic. 
Um, and because there's two businesses there, we determined that this wasn't really a viable solution. We've got to maintain access to these two businesses. So the second alternative we looked at was reconstructing the existing walls um, as is in place, just um, plain reconstructing them to fix the, the issues that have cropped up over the years. So the, the way in which these walls are built, um, you've essentially got layers of blocks. Each layer of block is tied back to approximately the center line of the, of the roadway um, with these, these tie back straps. And those are pinned into each layer of block, like I said. So in order to properly fix the wall, you would need to close the road, deconstruct the wall completely to um, verify that all those tie backs are installed correctly and then rebuild the wall kind of one layer of block at a time. Um, it would be impossible to leave half a lane open or half a, half a road width open, one lane open and reconstruct one wall and then, then reverse just through the, the nature of the construction of this type of wall. Um, so then we looked at, all right, well, if we need to shut this road down, how can we maintain access to those businesses? Um, and so there's a, a narrow strip of land connecting the two businesses over to Industrial Road. Um, so we, we contemplated constructing a, a secondary access road, a temporary access road here, but that would also require working in the buffer zone, um, cutting down an enormous number of trees, um, and then uh, basically eliminating that road and replanting the trees after we were done to restore it to in existing conditions. Um, and then that also leaves us with still having ownership and having to maintain two walls that are constructed basically on top of wetlands, which are um, not an ideal substrate for the construction of a wall. So there's some operation and maintenance concerns because um, every wall similar to that has a lifespan and we'd be looking at the same issue in you know 50 to 100 years. So that led us to the, the alternative that um, is before you this evening and that is the addition of earthen embankments, replacement of earthen embankments on um, either side of the roadway to buttress the existing retaining walls, effectively removing the retaining walls from service, um, and then extending the culvert that runs underneath the road out on both sides to accommodate the, the earthen embankments. Um, and of course, that's gonna necessitate the wetland impacts that are shown on the plans, and it requires us to replicate wetlands um, to match the, the amount that we're, we're planning to alter. Um, so those are the, the alternatives that we looked at. Ultimately, we chose the um, earthen embankment route because it's, it allows us to maintain access to those two businesses throughout the duration of construction. It eliminates the need to cut down a significant number of trees and build a road as a temporary access to those businesses. Um, and it eliminates future O&M costs from having to, to maintain those walls to support the, the roadway. Um, so that kind of led us, led us to where we're at tonight. Um, I know most of you attended the site walk um, a couple weeks ago, so I'd be happy to answer any other questions that, um, that might have come up um, or any other, any other issues you'd like to discuss. Thanks, Nick. Uh, uh, Mike, is there anyone in, in the public room there looking to comment on this? Let me see here. I don't think so. I think Commissioner Erickson was correct that he's the only one here for this item. Okay. Uh, fellow commissioners? And go go, go ahead, Nick. Thing, one other thing I'd like to add, too. So the just want to point out, so we are planning wetland replication to... Um, replicate the areas that we're planning to disturb and we're extending an existing culvert and the existing culvert does uh, does adhere to the Massachusetts stream crossing guidelines. Um, so we're essentially extending a compliant culvert um, and that would be that would be you know in order to accommodate the, the earth and embankments of, you know, obviously but um, just wanted to make that clear that we're not proposing a, a substandard culvert at all in this case. I could read um, a couple of the comments that Tim had included in that email from this afternoon, if, if that's okay. So yeah, sure. it's on the screen, but in case the print's too small. Uh, at the on-site, which was on May 17th, I think, uh, some surprise was expressed at, at just how much buffer zone and wetland resource area was impacted by the project. Having an independent peer review of the design was discussed. So I guess 
that would be to review Weston and Sampson's conclusions um, uh, and, and maybe, I don't know, examine yet another alternative. Nick, I know you, you might not have had a chance to really um, dive into that, but. Um, I think I could, I could explain, but I'm sure others that were there could as well. Um, it, it appeared that there's one section of the wall that's uh, potentially ser seriously compromised, but other long sections of the wall that don't appear to be that seriously compromised. And we were, some of us were wondering whether it was really necessary to take a wholesale approach to shoring up these, these two walls along their entire length, or whether a smaller, um, smaller scale approach might be sufficient and have a less um, negative impacts and cost too. Um, <clears throat> and that's when I think the idea came up of possibly um, using some funds to hire a third party uh, to do a, uh, uh, provide a second opinion. A structural engineer, I, I, I would think. And Ralph, just to, or Commissioner Baker, uh, yes. I apologize. Um, so just to uh, answer a couple of those questions that came up. Um, so the, the wall along its, the obvious defects in the wall are in one section, you're absolutely right. That's an area where um, a section of curbing along the backside of, of a low spot was removed to allow for roadway drainage and it eroded the wall and caused a, um, a pretty obvious failure at that one spot. But if you look longitudinally, um, you can see that the top of the wall is starting to push out uh, um, from the bottom layers. So each layer of block is supposed to be um, step back ever so slightly from the, the layer below it. And if you look at that from top to bottom along the entire length of both walls, you notice in, in multiple spots it's starting to push out. And what leads us to the, uh, the concept of, of buttressing the entire lengths of both walls is that that creates some um, doubt as to whether the wall was properly constructed and whether the, the necessary tiebacks for each layer of block were actually installed. So our concern is that if we repair just one area, when we dig it, we're gonna find additional areas um, that need to be addressed. And if we leave other sections of wall intact as is right now, we might have future failures because of the lack of those tiebacks. Um, if those tiebacks have been installed and it's and or installed correctly, we shouldn't be observing the failures that we're observing now. So that leads us to believe the entire walls, both of the walls um, along their entire stretch were not constructed properly. And we're starting to see failures in the, the, the weaker points now. And in the future, if left alone, we'd start to see additional failures along other spots of the wall. And that's kind of what we've observed since 2014 is what what started as one area that was noticeable because of the heavy erosion and whatnot behind the wall um, has progressed to visually observing areas of the walls pushing out in other locations. Um, and it's not limited to just the one wall that we originally observed. It's now the other wall in the opposite corner of kind of the, the outline of the roadway. So uh, I, I think that the uncertainty of whether it was built correctly or not is what's driving um, our, our choice to install the earthen embankments versus rebuild the wall or rebuild spots of the wall. But um, I would encourage you if, if um, you feel a third party review is necessary to exercise that option. Um, you know, we certainly wanna make sure we're looking out for the best interests of the city. Um, I mean, I've, I've reviewed this in a lot of detail and I'm confident with our decision tonight, but I'm also happy to have someone else take a look at it. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Any other commissioners looking for a comment? Can, can I, uh, just some clarification. When I hear both sides of the wall, uh, that to me sounds like it's two sides of a roadway. Do you mean both ends of the wall, two sides of the culvert? That's a yes or a no answer. Both, so, both, si both sides of the culvert? or both sides of the roadway? 
so there's two walls one on either side of the roadway and then the wall the wall on each side of the roadway has started to fail on both ends we didn't look so at the westerly the side, the upstream but side. that's that's part of the repair as well. Okay, and then our observation Correct. the other day when we went out there was 12 blocks at eight inches, uh, uh, eight, eight feet, the failure is exactly eight feet, the length of the wall on the easterly side. Uh, I'm kind of I'm kind of looking for accountability. Was it engineering? Was it construction? Or was it maintenance after the fact? Uh, uh, that ought to be flushed out here. And then, so, lastly, I'm not an engineer, so the idea of having an independent peer review. Oh, excuse me. I am an engineer without a degree, but having an independent peer review would make me feel better. Um, <clears throat> have you considered from eight feet down? going with a different block style that doesn't require tie-in, a very a larger block that doesn't require tie-in that will hold back eight foot of shoulder. Um, it sounds doable. And then you still have, your, you still have less disruption, uh, no more filling of the wetland, and I think you still have one-way traffic on the roadway if you do half it at a time. But. I think that would come out in a peer review. So I, we have considered various types of walls. Um, the engineering company that we did use, Weston and Sampson, produced a report that kind of walks through each, each of these alternatives. I'd be happy to forward that on. Um, and like I said, if, if you feel that a third party review is necessary, happy to have that done. Um, I know it was a three-part question, and I think I missed one. What was the, the middle question you asked, Mike? Well, I, 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 again, an alternate block style that wouldn't require tying in two sides of the roadway was my, my uh, unprofessional uh, solution. But it was, oh. it was shared with us by, by the engineer that we wouldn't be able to tell if there was wall failure below that. We'll fill in the wall from the backside with fill and, and riprap. Won't, won't tell us any more. Uh, I, I thought it was a weak answer, a weak rebuttal, uh, that we, we're not going to be able to take care of any failure in there, uh, or we don't know that there's an additional failure. Backfilling it, you still won't know. I, I just thought that was a weak alt response. So, so I think one of the other things, I'll start with one of the other things you mentioned, Mike, and that's accountability. So. Uh, Arbor Way was constructed uh, by the Redevelopment Authority back in the late 90s. Um, subsequently, it was turned over to the city. Um, we did a deep dive into the design plans, tried to find construction notes. We weren't able to dig those up from the Redevelopment Authority. We even asked the Redevelopment Authority to help pay for some of the engineering and construction costs for this. Um, and they, they weren't exactly that cooperative. So. That's where the, the accountability stands. Um, we're kind of left holding the bag due to something that was missed during designer construction. So I agree, accountability is an issue here. Um, we know who the, the culprit is, it's redevelopment authority, but we haven't been able to get them to take any, any sort of um, responsibility to address it. So there's that. As far as um, installing additional blocks to kind of reinforce the wall that don't require tiebacks, I mean, that that's certainly um, certainly an option. I don't know what size blocks that would require, but I think one of the issues that we're, we're kind of uncertain of is whether the, the soils that the wall were founded on um, are appropriate to support the, the structure of the wall and the roadway itself. So I, I think there's some question there. And I don't, think the, I, I don't think the soils are suitable. I think that's one of the reasons why the wall is starting to, to fail. Um, and I guess the, the second part of that is if we were to buttress the walls with an earthen embankment, it kind of eliminates the need to figure out what the failures were with the wall because the walls are now buttressed with an earthen embankment and there's really no reason to explore any further that, that fixes any issues of the walls failing because they've been buttressed with, with an earthen embankment. Um, now I think 
there were two kind of methods of failure, mechanisms of failure here. One was the removal of that curbing along the backside of the low spot in the point where the failure is most obvious, which caused an erosion behind the wall and a failure in that spot. But then the failures that we observed on the wall on the opposite side of the roadway and further down on the, the opposite end of the roadway um, obviously aren't, aren't related to that erosion issue. They're related to something else entirely. And that we, we suspect is um, either improper construction or an improper assumption made during the design process. Um, and without fully rebuilding those walls, I don't think we'll really understand that. Um, but it, you know, it's a good suggestion to buttress those walls with, with some sort of a, a larger block. The, the way that the engineer explained it to me is that if we were to use some sort of a, a wall built in front of the existing wall, is we need to use what they call soil nails to fasten those blocks to the existing wall and earthen uh, earth behind it. So um, the, the cost of that is astronomically more expensive than just bringing in fill and um, addressing the problem that way. Nick, if I, while we're on the subject, uh, at that site walk, the commission saw a, maybe a route for an access road down to the base of the wall where construction vehicles would have to get, but we only went on the downstream side. It, I assuming it's just as steep and wooded on the opposite side, the upstream side? It is, yes. Um, so that, that access road actually goes down to a, a drainage basin that's a little further down. Um, so it's meant as a way to, to get down there and, and access that for maintenance. Um, I'm sure it was used in construction of the wall too, but that's, I think that's one of the reasons why it's still there. Okay. Go ahead, Joyce. Go ahead, Joyce. Thank you. Um, Nick, this is Joyce Jacobs. I have um, one question regarding the truck transit that goes um, across that uh, culvert right now. The gentleman from Harvey that was with us the night we were at the site walk said there were 20 to 25 tons, or each truck is 20 to 25 tons, and there are 125 to 150 trucks per day. Do you know um, if Weston, in their calculations, about this plan has accounted for that amount of traffic so that this can sustain um, the weight that's gonna be on there and hold the wall up? They have with the calculations for the earthen embankments. Um, when we were going through alternatives, they, they considered that fact as well. Um, so I think, I, I believe that's why the one of the other alternatives was um, using soil nails to stabilize the existing walls with um, a, basically additional blocks put in front of it. Um, and it, I, I'm ninety-nine percent sure that that the reason was the large volume of truck traffic there. I guess, though, at the time, Joyce, to your point, maybe it wasn't anticipated that be a waste hauler. Uh, back when the right when that part started. of the original as as Nick said you know the, the original development of the project may thought of maybe it was going to be passenger car traffic not necessarily the truck traffic that so we have to plan for that now because that's going to continue right and it's very possible that that was a an error in assumption when they originally designed the wall um, so that the type of block that they used it's the versa lock block retaining wall it's, in my opinion, it's really meant for like smaller, like three to four foot high, like landscape or residential retaining walls. It's really not meant um, for a, a 20 plus foot wall on either side of a, a roadway that supports heavy truck traffic. Um, th that's just my, my professional opinion. I, I wouldn't have spec'd out a wall such as this for this development um, if I was the design engineer, but um, you know, here we are 20 years later and we don't really have any way to hold the designer personally accountable, um, especially since we've already taken over the road as the city and so on and so forth. So um, it's just, it's unfortunate. I have a question. Uh, Commissioner Erickson, uh, I can see how the earthen embankment approach is going to stabilize the two walls, but I'm not sure uh, what the resulting performance is going to be of the roadway itself. 
uh, has have there been any soil borings or, or uh, geotechnical investigations done to determine whether there I mean maybe there's large voids in there already in the um, in the road surface itself will still uh, continue to subside despite the proposed earthen embankment. That's a, a potential issue. We have not done any geotechnical borings. Um, we're scared to do geotechnical borings out of fear of, of further weakening whatever ties might exist in the wall or within the, the structure of the roadway. Um, but it's, it's a, a valid concern. There, there could be voids under there. Um, I will say we, we haven't noticed any evidence of, of um, fine material washout from within the wall. Um, you don't see any evidence of that really downstream. Um, and we haven't seen any real uh, sinkhole formation or anything like that within the roadway itself, which would, you know, it, it would probably happen within a year or two of, of a, a major void forming underneath uh, bare pavement such as that. Um, but certainly a concern, it, it might be a situation where, you know, after, after we finish the earthen embankments, a couple of years go by, everything settles out, and then we eventually have to repave the roadway. Um, the roadway itself is getting towards the end of its its expected life. Um, you know, pavement typically lasts 20 to 30 years. Um, development was built in the late 90s, and here we are in, in 2022. So we're, we're getting towards the end of that road's lifespan anyhow. Um, so I, I wouldn't be surprised if we need to repave it just due to the the need of, of repaving, um, but we'd continue to monitor it prior to, or uh, after construction to, to see if there's any other issues and address those as they come up. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Um, kind of sounds like as a commission, we'd like to make a motion to proceed uh, kind of on Tim's uh, suggestion of independent analysis. Okay. Yeah. And on that, Nick, um, I won't put you on the spot, but it, so there's a couple of on-call engineers um, that the city has a contract with. Do we, we obviously pick one of the other ones um, other than Wesson and Sampson, uh, right? And right. the other is, is who's, who's footing the bill for this? Is the applicant, is the commission, is because it's both the city, really. I suppose so that is. Go ahead, Just Nick. to weigh in a little bit on it, so we have uh, an, a free cash appropriation of $600,000 that's been made uh, by the mayor's office, and that's to cover design costs and construction costs. Um, the way things are trending right now with fuel and uh, labor costs, I, as it is, I don't believe that we're going to have enough to cover construction. Um, we had anticipated mm -hmm. this project bid last summer, essentially, but... Um, Due to various staffing issues at the DPW, um, the project was put on hold, and you know we weren't able to submit until this year. So uh, we didn't necessarily anticipate the the rate of inflation that we're seeing now. Um, so we're kind of left in a bind with having to try to save money wherever we can. That being said, because we're not going to have, or I'm not anticipating having enough to cover construction anyways, I'm probably going to have to go back to City Council and ask for additional funding. So I think our budget could take a, a hit uh, to hire a third party to, to take a look at this. Um, I'm guessing it'll probably be some somewhere along the lines of like a, a $5,000-ish effort. Um, and we could use one of the other on-calls besides Weston and Sampson. So um, we'd have to see who's kind of pre-qualified in, in the category that applies to this project, but um, maybe a Fuss and O'Neill or something like that. Well, there is, as the commission knows, has its own wetlands protection account, um, or you could split it. I mean, there's about mm, 18, 20,000 in the wetlands protection account, the last I checked. So there's a couple I, avenues to, to achieve getting the analysis done. But, uh, like you said, it's I a little it, bit. If it makes the commissioners feel more comfortable in making a, a decision, it, it's probably worth spending the money. And getting this to a point where you can go out to bid for it. Okay, I, I don't know if the discussion is done, but I'd like to make a motion that uh, we split the cost 
uh, of hiring a, uh, uh, a second opinion engineer from the ones that are already uh, on retainer within the city and um, ask them to uh, quickly um, take a look at this situation and report back to us. I think that would, you know, obviously produce quick results and shared costs uh, isn't a burden on either side of the fence, so to speak. And I personally, as a commissioner, uh, am okay without the independent analysis, but um, I see s some value in it. Um, that's where my opinion lies. And Mike, do you have something to say? Um, Mr. Christensen? I, w <coughs> I would like to see us. <coughs> A second analysis. Uh, I guess I'm a little uncertain. Is that the norm that we would split the cost of the second engineer for the analysis? Or I think, like Mike, kind of hinted, it's a little bit of a technicality this time because you know we're, we are the commission well, and it's also the city. Um, right. Well, ordinarily it'd be on the on the shoulders of the applicant. Okay. But usually we have a private applicant. Okay. You know, I'm we, just asking that question. It's a good okay. question. But I would like to, I'd like the second opinion. I would second that motion. I think it's uh, just uh, Commissioner Helene, unless uh, I'd like no, to proceed with the motion. I think that's a solid plan, and I think that's fair um, since we're requesting a second. L a little louder, Mary. Oh, I think that that's fair. I think that that's a very fair approach to this. So, um, yeah. I guess there's been a motion, so we can take it to vote. And... Okay. Okay. There's a motion and a second. Yep. There's a motion and a second. So uh, I'm just going to do the roll call here. Uh, Commissioner Helene? Aye. Commissioner Baker? Aye. Commissioner Donnelly? Aye. Commissioner Christensen? Aye. Commissioner Bro? Um, uh, no on this one, but uh, passes. Thanks, thanks, Nick. Yep, um, happy to happy to present. Um, so I'll work with Mike to um, have one of our on-call consultants take a look at it. I'll forward on any and all data and information we have dating back to you know 2014. Um, I'd like them to review more than just the NOI. So um, kind of keeping it consistent. Right. Consistent with what um, Commissioner Donnelly suggested, I'd like to have them take a look at the structural engineering aspect of it too, um, and not just the NOI submission and kind of like a you know a three thousand foot view. I'd like them to dive into it a little bit, understand the history, and and really, I mean, if we're going to spend the money, I'd, I'd like to make sure that you know we're we're making sure that Weston Sampson's work passes the the sniff test, so to speak. So. Um, I'll work with Mike on that, and we'll we'll get this done. Thanks. Thank you. Do you want to stick around for the next item, too, um, by the way, Nick? Sure. Which is? Which uh, is, uh, yep, yeah, calling uh, notice of intent, Fitchburg School Department, uh, Crocker Field Turf and Track Improvements, uh, listed 25 Circle Street. And for that, um, I see Craig Chalifaux. Um, Mr. Lamy from the school department. Oh, and um, sorry, let me get to, oh, Kathleen. Yep, Kathy Herbo with Gail. And you should have a Matt um, Kinlan with Gail as well. Uh, okay. All of you folks are... Um, All visible? Un well, unmuted anyway. <laughs> unmuted. Let me get the... Uh, let me call this up on the screen so we know what we're uh, uh, looking at. We may as well go directly into the into the plans. So let me scooch down because they're all the way at the tail end <laughs> of. That gets you an idea, Kathleen. Do you want to give a um, kind of a synopsis um, of what what's proposed here, or who? Yeah, I it? just. Yep, I'd just like to start um, by thanking you all for having us here tonight. And um, as you know, we're here to request approval of the notice of intent 
um, to install uh, turf field at the Crocker Field as well as a um, reconstruction of the turf field and some improvements to the athletic lighting. Um, I'm going to let Matt um, give you a little bit of detail on existing conditions and such. Um, Matt's the senior engineer on the project. I'm the project manager um, on, for Gale Associates. Good evening, everyone. Can everyone hear me all right? Yes, sir. Awesome. So as Kathy mentioned, my name is Matt Kendall with Gale Associates. Um, our services were obtained by the uh, City of Fitchburg School District. Uh, to design and permit a new track and turf field for the existing track and, and field at Crocker Field. Uh, so a little background on the site. The existing site consists of a, of a grass field located inside an irregular shaped track uh, with associated track and field events surrounding uh, the area. There is a large grandstand that wraps around the track and field to the southwest. Uh, currently, the track is at the end of its useful life, and uh, due to the high use demand of the grass field, um, the field is becoming over compacted, uh, which is resulting in field quality issues and the need for frequent maintenance. Uh, a granite wall separates the field and the Nashua River to the north slash northeast. Uh, a wetlands delineation was, was done uh, to locate the bank of the river. Um, the wetlands delineation found that the bank of the river basically runs right along that granite wall, um, which puts our site inside the 200 foot riverfront buffer zone. Uh, and according to the FEMA flood maps, we are also located in uh, considered to be bordering land subject to flooding. Um, so we're not touching any structures or anything on this site. We're, we're really only, only working on the, the track and inside the field. Um, <clears throat> so the proposed project is going to include the reclamation of the existing track. Um, we're going we're gonna to reclaim that and stockpile it, uh, get everything graded, and then reuse that in the same layout that's existing. Um, the only difference in, is that we're going we're gonna to reclaim the... Uh, as you can see right there, the, the high jump area, we're gonna, we're gonna move that from outside of the track and put it inside there, uh, just to make it closer to all the other events. Uh, the existing grass field inside is gonna be uh, stripped of the grass and topsoil, and uh, that's where the new turf field will be installed. Uh, so the turf field is gonna consist of, on average, 10 inch depth of uh, crushed stone with a subsurface drainage system that, that ties into the existing system. Uh, and then it's gonna be covered by the, the permeable turf carpet. Uh, the crushed stone provides stormwater storage during rain, uh, rainfall events. And uh, once the crushed stone reaches its capacity, the, the proposed drainage system routes uh, the stormwater to the overflow outlet. The overflow outlet is gonna be the same outlet that is, exists on the property, uh, so we're not we're not moving stormwater anywhere. We're we're good, putting it all through the same place, and it's gonna uh, it's the runoff is gonna reduce for all the required storms, and the uh, the system has been designed to comply with all ten of the mass stormwater management standards. And that is about the scope of the project. Yeah. One other note is we are not raising the elevation or anything affiliated with the, with the site um, other than a minor um, to make sure that the track and field, um, particularly the track, has to have a cross slope on it um, and then designing the field inside it. As um, part of our submittal package, we did submit the stormwater report, um, as Matt said, um, showing, you know, using HydroCAD and such, showing how um, we are not increasing um, any of the peak storm flows um, as required. We will be providing erosion control, um, you know, up prior to any construction having it be installed. And um, that's really it. chemicals or anything like from the track surface or the lawn chemicals being leached into the stormwater but I mean you guys have said it meets the stormwater yes yeah. so um, 
chemicals the track we actually are required to strip the existing track surface or what's left of it and that will be removed and disposed of um, as a proper waste in accordance with EPA um, the soils that are being removed um, obviously have fertilizer that's been put on there over the years um, keep in mind with the turf field that gets eliminated which actually helps with water quality um, as well as um, having the stone base and such under the field, you know, helps infiltrate um, the water and such. Um, so we've kind of, we've taken um, the fertilizer of so that treatment, um, you know, out of the um, equation. Thank you. Um, open the floor. Uh, is there just anyone else in the in the chat room since we've been uh, uh, undergoing this notice of intent? Uh, sometimes people pop in. Just just so you know, the project will take probably be done in a summer um, summer time frame. It's only a matter of weeks, and the um, the actual removal of the topsoil stuff. Um, only takes um, a week or so, and then after that, um, everything is you know maintained and, and confined to that track and field area. Right. I think the only other folks here are um, Craig Shalifo and uh, Matt. Um, I'm Just two you had mentioned um, before. Uh, Lamy. Yeah. I okay. Think both, both of the school department. Okay. Uh, moving on to my fellow commissioners, uh, Commissioner Helene and Commissioner Baker. Uh, if you'd like to speak, go for it. Commissioner Donnelly, Commissioner Christensen. <clears throat> the commission just recently uh, approved the Pittsburgh State University uh, reinstallation of turf without a lot of kickback, discussion, whatever. I, I, I would entertain a, a motion when it's time uh, for a site visit and uh, and at least take a look at the riverfront uh, on the other side of the wall. But I think they're quite better protected from the Nashville River than FSU was in Baker Brook. And that went off without a hitch. And I, I would like the plans to go to Tim Smith. He hasn't received these. Uh, I think that's only fair. He is our consultant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's that's also good. Uh, maybe make note of that, Mike, to see if we can uh, definitely get Tim Smith uh, to draft an opinion here. Um, I personally share that that you know that's probably the most vulnerable to any construction going on, uh, as Mike stated, over on that other side near the wall by the river. Um, but I, I I tend to uh, definitely yield in favor of this and add it to. The recent improvements uh, at Crocker Field that have happened in the last few years here. So, if I could ask um, either Matt or um, Kathleen, so there's no additional discharge to the Nashua. That's correct. That is correct. And improvements to stormwater quality on on the way there, I guess. Um, what happens compared to the present situation? Um, under the present situation, there's an underdrain system under the field. Um, you can kind of see, I don't know, but yeah, this is our demo plan, but that shows the existing line. See kind of that herringbone pattern going through the field. Mm -hmm. um, those lines all kind of come together. There's a few structures around the outside of the field, actually in the field, outside the field. Um, those feed to the main outlet that's located kind of up at the very top there. Um, and then discharge to the river. Um, we're proposing um, our under drain system, which is, which is kind of similar, that goes under the turf field, under the stone. Um, and like I said, the stone um, acts as a deterrent. It, you know, it delays the flow, um, but also um, allows additional infiltration prior to the discharge. Um, and we are going out of the same pipe. Just so you know, back, I want to say it was in the spring, we actually worked with the DPW and analyzed all the existing pipes to make sure they were in good shape, or at least the ones that were not removing. A lot of the ones within the field we are going to be removing. 
Um, but the main, a lot of the main structures, kind of the outside where you see some manholes and such, those will be remaining. And um, like I said, we did do a survey with the DPW's help um, to confirm that those lines were all in good shape and functioning. I don't know if um, the commissioner has anything. Yeah, I was gonna say, uh, Nick, are you still available uh, to us to comment on, on this project? Yep, yep, I'm still here, um, thank you. Um, so I, I can vouch for um, the fact that DPW went out there and helped camera the lines to make sure um, they were in good condition prior to the work taking place. Um, so I, I took a look at the stormwater calculations, um, the post, Construction uh, peak rates are, are definitely um, at or below the existing conditions peak rates. Um, and based on the, the design of the fields, there, there's certainly more potential for infiltration based on that, that stone layer underneath the, the turf um, than what's, what's there with existing soil and whatnot. Um, so overall, I think it's a good design. Um, I, don't, I don't see any issues with it. Um, you know, there is that separation between the, the river and the proposed work uh, by the, the field itself and the, the walls surrounding it. So um, as long as proper care is taken to protect any inlet um, that exists between the, the field and the river, um, there shouldn't be any sedimentation or anything of the sort during construction. Um, and I think the, the plan here too is that to try to work with schools uh, department and the you know, engineering firm and the contractor and whatnot and try to recycle some of the, the excess topsoil that's being stripped from the site and use it elsewhere in the city. Um, so that would definitely be a bonus for DPW. How long is this turf um, rated to last? So the project- the Turf, over. you mean overall? Overall, the turf field, the turf itself, which we refer to the carpet, which is kind of what you recognize, the top, that top, they'll last um, 10 to 15 years if maintained um, properly. The stone underneath stays pretty much, you know, for a lifetime. So when we come back, you know, when you come back in 10, 15 years, when the turf has kind of reached its end life, um, we basically just come in and replace the carpet, just like you would in your home. They take it out, they roll it up, take it off, and then bring in a new one and, and lay it down. You know, the uh, Fritzburg Sates track and feel that Mr. Donnelly referred to um, earlier, that, that's just about 15, 17 years old now. And they're, yep. they're almost done ripping up the, uh, the track and the turf. Um, stopped there one day last week. Could I ask what, what, time, what time frame, like what time of year um, during the summer, I, I guess, when the yeah, project we, happens? We, we, we usually do it during the summer. A lot of time that's because of um, athletic programs, you know, there's not as much during the summer. Obviously, we we coordinate that with the city um, to identify the best use. Um, our hope would be, um, or speaking for the school, um, I'm not sure if Craig's on or not, but um, speaking for the school, you know, our hope would be to do it next summer. Um, we won't get it done this year, um, partly because of you know all the. The issues everyone else is having with getting um, materials and such and just you know delivery and whatever and also the turf industry is very very busy this summer so um, our best bet is to get this out to bid at the end of the year um, so that we're ready to roll um, at the spring and if the city decides to do it in the spring great the summer great or we can even do it in the fall the only th thing you sometimes have to watch is the track has to be the last thing in they do the field first, then they do the final track. Um, and then obviously, you know, it's like a paving job. You have to watch, you know, cold weather, things like that. One last one, I don't know whether this is for um, Wesson or, or Gale rather, or, or the schools, but how, how, does, how much does this cost and how, how is it paid for through a grant or something? So yeah, we can. I can speak to that quickly. Um, we had applied through the NFL uh, for a grant last year. We were uh, on a short list and we are reapplying. Actually, the application, I believe, is either going in very shortly or has just been submitted. Tom, is if you can. But we are we are pursuing grant funding to help um, 
fund the, the cost of the project. Okay. The, Good. the track is currently at end of life. We're very close to it. The lights are as well. So this was a project that we would be taking on and <clears throat> made the decision that we would, we would look to turf um, the field itself. Um, there was a study done on it not long ago through the Crocker Field Restoration mm -hmm. uh, Committee that, that deemed that the, the grass surface in the, in the underlying soils are you know, extremely compacted and need a lot of tender loving care just to get them back to a playable surface, which is really limiting us to the amount of traffic that we can have, unfortunately, on the field. So many of our high school athletes and sports that have played on Crocker Field in the past, we've really been having to limit the amount of uh, usage, which is not something that we want to continue with. And be able to increase the access to the field for all children and, and all um, the entire city actually and open it up to the public so it can be used more consistently over a longer period of time. Okay, good. I have a question. Um, I look, it seems like a good proposal uh, on the face of it. One of the things I noticed is a number of notes in these uh, plans indicating that various trees would be protected and not removed. Um, that said, are there are there some trees that will be removed in this project? Um, I, I don't think we are really um, impacting the trees because we're staying within the existing track. So I don't think we're taking down any of the trees. We just note for the ones, the existing ones to, to be protected. Maybe, I guess, well, no, not even at the front area. I was just looking at that front entrance, but um, no, our, and Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we're um, any trees. We just, we note all the work is basically within that dark line that you see. I don't know if you can scroll to the top of the page again. Um, you see there's a dark line that's pretty much our limited construction, but, um, you know, based on our demo, we, we do, the, do the tree protection. Just anywhere where we think we might be getting close, um, you know, we, we just want to make sure those trees are taken care of, but we're not really um, going outside that track other than you can see the existing um, long jump, triple jumps. You can see those runways will be paving. But that, you know, they're there. We're just going in and, you know, resurfacing. Good, thank you. Thank you. Kathleen, that, th this project doesn't um, affect the, the field house or the tennis courts at all, or, or what? Can no. I have the same question? <laughs> I, I just yeah. know that aging tennis courts kind of sits there adjacent to the, to the clubhouse. Well, we had several discussions with the team, um, but at this point, it's not in, uh, it's not in the scope. Okay, thanks. Michael had suggested a site walk. When would you like? Yeah, um, we're going to do a, a weekday one again. Those, Up to the commission. Those tend to work work the best. Um, get the calendars out. Yeah. At least within the next, let's say, three to four weeks. Is it Tuesday or Wednesdays? I kind of tend to forget. Um, like, Wednesday. So Wednesday the 6th would be the next commission meeting, July 6th. Yeah. Or uh, I guess I'm saying we tend to congregate on these weekday oh. site walks more frequently on a Tuesday or a Wednesday? Uh, Tuesday is a popular night for a meeting, period. So yeah. if it's like the last Tuesday, I couldn't, unless you did it early before 6. Pick a... Yeah, I want to stick with the Wednesday. Go with the Wednesday. Uh, Wednesday, uh, June twenty second. Anybody get any objections to that day? Twenty two Wednesday. Twenty two Wednesday. Commissioner Helene and Commissioner Baker, any uh, scheduling conflicts for for you guys on that end? Yes, I'm sorry that that won't work for me. Okay, Commissioner Helene. I would be fine with that date. Um, and we can obviously. Uh, kind of posted our email threads for, for Tracy and stuff. Uh, yeah. We'll relay that back yeah. to her. Um, and now the folks from um, Gail, uh, are you coming from a distance? Uh, and does that a good yeah, we, work? We, we can attend. I, I actually live in Southboro, Hopkinton, so I'm not that far from you. Okay. Um, and we also can have our wetland scientist on site as well if you think it's necessary. 
Okay, we can if, forward. If, if they're available, yeah, please include them. Uh, okay. Time. Six. Uh, can I just ask on the 22nd, like time frame, roughly, just so I know whether it's <laughs> early, late, what, you know, just so we have a, I can at least give them a tentative. Yeah, um, yeah, of course. Uh, the, the days are our longest, so uh, the 6 p.m. Uh, does that work for okay. everyone? Okay. Okay. We'll schedule okay. for that. Sure. I'll... One more time, Mary. Yeah, that that's all right. Okay. Once again, I won't be able to attend. <coughs> that's okay. all right. You can go ahead. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, I guess a motion then to um... please procure a motion from someone on my board. In for a site walk um, at 6 p.m. on what, what was the date? 622. 622. You get a second? Second. Uh, and somebody include continuing this until June uh, or July 6th as well. Continuing the here. Well, that's a question, I guess. If you have a quorum um, and the commission is comfortable with doing it, you could take a vote. At, at, at the at, at the, the cycle, knock one thing yeah. off the agenda. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, so we have to add that. You're saying that little nuance into the. In the alternative, that a decision is not made at the June 22nd site walk, um, that the hearing be continued until the July 6th regular meeting. Okay. Okay. Uh, can we just? You can just say so moved. <laughs> yeah. Let the let the record reflect. Uh, that version of our motion. Uh, uh, got to do, do the roll call. So, I, or did, did I do the? Sorry, did I do the roll call already? Oh, geez, I'm all confused. No, not yet. Yeah, Commissioner Helene. Aye. Commissioner Baker. Aye. Commissioner Donnelly. Aye. Commissioner Christensen. Aye. Commissioner Bro is in favor. Aye. And thank you all who joined us uh, for that NOI. Okay. Right. Thank you, Yale Thank folks you. in school. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and if you need anything or whatever, please let us know any questions come up in between. You can reach out to Matt or myself. I know uh, Mike has all our contact information. So. And I'll, I'll follow that up uh, tomorrow with an email just confirming uh, the date so you can um, disseminate to your wetlands person and whoever. Okay, Kathy. Perfect. Thank Perfect. you all. Thank you all. Appreciate Thank you. your time. Take care. Thank you. Yep, bye-bye. Uh, tonight's commission meeting uh, goes on to notice of intent, Woodland Estates, Manufactured Home Park, uh, Ringe Road. Uh, it's a refiling uh, of the number 155513. And just for the record, it should show that Mr. Christian is stepping down because of the uh, conflict of interest. Let the record reflect. Commissioner Christensen has recused himself. I don't we, st we still have Mary and we still have Ralph. So we still, still have, have a quorum. quorum, yeah. We still have numbers. I'm sorry, I don't see how that makes a quorum. Wait. Four? One, two, three, four is a quorum of seven. Oh, yes, of course, you're right. I'm, I was miscounting. Go ahead. <laughs> two plus two is five. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> It's high level math, you know. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. For the record, Jamie Rowe from Whitman and Bingham, a division of Haley Ward. And my client this evening is Joanne Hamburg of Woodland Estates. Uh, before I begin, I have some plans I'd like to hand out if possible. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Didn't know who she was. Thank you. Thank you. Plans I handed out are basically 11 by 17 version of the uh, submitted site plans years ago to the commission and to the planning board. Highlighted uh, on the plans in blue, the wetlands, in yellow, the buffer zone, and in red, 
the wetland replication. Before I begin, a little housekeeping. Mike, I emailed you the yep. uh, butter notifications. Is that good enough, or would you like the originals? Um, that, you tell I can take the originals as well, sure. Gotcha. Well, it is great to be in person, finally. It's been a long time. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to review a little bit uh, with the Commission um, the events that have taken place over the past six months so you understand we've been working on this with the Planning Board and the CONCOM and so that everybody understands what we've been doing because even though we haven't been here in a while, we've made some progress with the Planning Board. Um, in November 2021, I came to the Planning uh, Conservation Commission and gave you a general update on what's going on with the project. In November 2021 as well, after that meeting, we had a site walk, and most of the commission made that site walk to view the site. In December 2021, it was continued to January, which I attended in January 2022, for another update uh, to the Conservation Commission and we heard some testimony from abutters as well at that meeting. And I explained to the commission at that time, most of the concerns I'm hearing are planning board related. And then I went off to the planning board to address those concerns. On January 25th, uh, 2022, I gave a general update to the planning board on what's going on, and there was some abutter testimony then. Same thing happened in March 22, 2022. Uh, public comments and continued discussion with the planning board to figure out what the planning board wanted to do with respect to these comments from the abutters. On April 26th, um, I agreed to open up the public hearing for the special permit and site plan approval so that the planning board could modify their permit and issue amended conditions. And that, that did happen on the 26th and the planning board voted to uh, issue the permit with amended conditions. The conditions that they voted on and discussed, no work shall, be placed, shall take place on Sundays and holidays, no blasting or rock hammering on weekends or holidays. Construction hours are limited to 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Saturday. Uh, anytime blasting occurs on this project, uh, the applicant has to perform another pre-blast survey within 300 feet of the project. Every time blasting occurs, even though it's a permit issued by the fire department, all abutters need to be notified. No construction vehicles over the weight limit of the bridges in the vicinity shall take place. So the applicant was put on notice that there have been potential trucks above and beyond the minimum weight limit. I'm not sure if that happened or didn't happen, uh, but everybody was put on notice. Uh, please be within those weight limits. Uh, we had to resolve the drainage problems on the abutting property. We talked about at the very end of the cul-de-sac, there was ponding on the abutters property. Uh, to my knowledge, we have taken care of that temporarily, and the permanent solution is a catch basin was placed on the plans at the end of that cul-de-sac. And that's going to drain any water that ponds and put it into the drainage system. So once that catch basin is installed, there will be no issues. Uh, dust mitigation has to be taken care of with respect to blasting and construction activities. Uh, one of Butter said there was some wall damage, uh, stone wall damage, which is a property line. So we're going to look into that. Uh, they wanted to make sure proper erosion controls was taken were installed. And the project was given a limit. By 12-31-2024, the project is complete. All construction will be done prior to that date. The project basically turns into a pumpkin at midnight. Manufactured homes can be placed on the pads after that date as long as all the site work is complete. 
So that happened on April 20, 2022, and Mike is in the process of uh, drafting up that revised permit. And so everything I just stated that happened on the 26th uh, was a result of hearing testimony from abutters uh, that they've been putting up with this project for quite some time, and they had another chance to uh, voice those concerns, and the planning board voted uh, an amended order of conditions. The day after uh, that public hearing and the day after the planning board um, voted to issue that permit, I sent an email uh, to Mike O'Hara, Tracy, the chairperson, and Tim Smith notifying, uh, and Mike knew this, but again, I, I sent it to him and, and copied Tracy and Tim, asking if uh, you would like me to come to the next board meeting, uh, which is May, and update the commission on what happened. And uh, in the event uh, I didn't hear, I did mention in that email that I'll be filing a notice of intent within two to three weeks. So I didn't attend the meeting in May, which I would have happily done that. I just didn't hear back. So that said, we're here today to file a notice of intent because the order of conditions expired. There are three uh, areas that we need to finish the work on. Wetland replication, general cleanup within the buffer zone, and we have to finish the stormwater management system. All of that is being proposed as uh, in this notice of intent. The wetland replication area is highlighted in red on the plans that I gave you. And uh, based upon the wetland, wetland filling that happened on this project, there was 225 square feet that was filled and we're proposing 450 square feet of wetland replication, a two to one. Could that be three to one? Absolutely. Could it be four to one? Absolutely. But keep in mind, the bigger we get in this area, the more disturbance that's going to happen, abutting this wetland and in the buffer zone, and that means maybe mature trees will have to come down. I'm trying to av avoid that scenario. The, uh, I've scheduled a meeting uh, with Marianne DePinto on or about the 17th or 18th of June. We're gonna meet on site, and I'm gonna show her the area of the wetland replication. She's gonna draft up a wetland replication plan. Uh, and we will, we will submit this to the Conservation Commission prior to the next meeting in July, so that you can review it, comment, and we can revise it if necessary. The reason I did that is because there is a wetland replication plan with the plans that we submitted with the Notice of Intent that was previously approved by the Conservation Commission way back when. Unfortunately, when the wetlands were filled, typically the old mentality is when you fill a wetland, you scrape off the hydric soils, you stockpile it, and you use that for the wetland replication area. You excavate the wetland replication area, you put the existing hydric soils that you stockpiled into this area, and then you do some additional planting. Well, that wetland uh, soil was not stockpiled, so we have to go to a plan B. There is a definite way to do this without having the hydric soils, and that's why Mary Ann DePinto is going to be involved in preparing this plan to the commission, and I'll be here to uh, present it, and Mary Ann DePinto will be here uh, via um, online so you can ask her any questions you have. And she will also be made available to the commission if you'd like to walk the site with her and she can explain everything to you on site. So we have that set up the week of the 17th. It would be done sooner, but she's visiting her son in Colorado and she'll be out of town. Uh, with respect to the general cleanup that I mentioned in the buffer zone, it's been taken care of. Um, Bottom line is right after the planning board meeting, I called a meeting with Joanne Hamburg and the contractors, and we basically spent a couple hours on site, and I went over everything with them, so they fully understand where the planning board and potentially the CONCOM is coming from, and I explained all the work that has to be completed. One of the items was the general cleanup, and they've already taken care of that, so that's already taken care of, but that's up to the commission to decide, and if there's anything else you'd like done, happy to do it. We also have to finish the stormwater management system. Now, that said, the stormwater basin is already installed. Uh, the four bays have to be installed. We have to lumen seed the bottom of the basin, and it has to be finished correctly, right? So that, that has to be done. The stormwater basin is outside the buffer zone. 
but there's going to be a stormwater swale from the basin to the discharge down near the bridge or the culvert that has to be riprap. So there's some stormwater management that has to be done in the buffer zone. That's why I included it. And I think on the site walk, most of you saw that, that that, that had to be done as well. Moving forward, hopefully we can get all of these things done prior to uh, December 31st, 2024, so that we can tighten up this project and nobody has to deal with it moving forward. My recommendations to the commission moving forward, if you're so inclined to issue an order of conditions so the project can be completed. <clears throat> Given the fact that many, many years has taken place and not all, not all the work has been completed, I'm sure there's a lack of confidence on the, on the Conservation Commission's part. Will this work get done? And I, and I have the same concerns as well. So that said, I would offer up to the board or the commission that a performance bond potentially be issued for the wetland replication. The applicant has agreed to that. So that's a condition that you can place on the project. And that is entirely up to you. I offer it to you so that you have confidence that this will be completed prior to three years from issuing the order of conditions. A site as built, an engineer certificate be issued with the request for a certificate of compliance so that you know everything was done where it should have been done, at the correct elevation, location, and everything is working correctly. At least you'll have that prior to the certificate of compliance so that you have confidence everything is completed the way it should be completed. I also offer up uh, at the end of every year an engineer's report be submitted to the Conservation Commission outlining what has been done and what has to be done so that you have that and we can have a discussion at a meeting and make sure that uh, the correct process and progress is being made every single year to get this done. That's, that's a benefit to the commission, a benefit to myself, the applicant, and all the abutters, all at the same time as far as I'm concerned. Keep in mind when this project came before you, there was already an existing trailer park there. So <clears throat> the access road into the site was already completed. That's why a lot of work wasn't done at the time the original notice of intent was, was filed. There was already a culvert, there was already a roadway, and it didn't have to be expanded that much. That's why you only have 250 square feet of wetlands being filled at the time. I did a little research, I was curious when that existing trailer park was constructed, um, I saw historical aerial photos dating back to 1963. So it's been there for quite some time. And Joanne has expanded it uh, quite, some, quite a bit from that, from that point. With respect to the stormwater management system, <clears throat> this drainage report was submitted to the commission. It was approved years ago and I'm sure you don't remember everything about it, but I wanna let you know uh, the executive summary of the peak flows, uh, the way the detention basin was designed. For the two year storm, comparing existing uh, conditions to proposed conditions, there's a decrease of 0.48 CFS. 10 year storm, a decrease of 2.56. A 25-year storm, a decrease of 4.98, and a decrease of 10.72 for the 100-year storm. So the detention basin is making sure that there's no peak, in, there's no increase in the peak rate of runoff, comparing post-construction to existing conditions. So that's going to be functioning uh, as designed, as long as it's constructed properly. And again, if you follow my recommendation for an as-built plan and certification prior to the issuance of a certificate of compliance, you'll know exactly uh, if it was constructed properly and give you confidence in issuing that certificate of compliance. That said, I'm here to answer any questions you have to move this forward. I'm also happy to uh, schedule another site walk if you so are inclined to do that. Again, whatever we need to do to move this forward so this project's in, in completed from our point of view, your point of view, and the abutter's point of view, more importantly. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. That was certainly very thorough.
uh, bringing us all up to speed on, on these matters. Uh, first, going to the public. Is there anyone uh, in our virtual chat room or in our physical chat room? Well, there's the, uh, the applicant, Joanne um, Gurren. Uh, also, Councilor Fleming is in attendance, and um, Hal Melanson. All virtually. All virtually. Anyone? So anyway, I think you have the ability to um, to speak if anyone would would like of um, Arissa or Hal. I think we have someone here definitely uh, been in the room with us tonight. Just seeing if anyone in that chat room had their hand up. That's all. I don't see hands raised now. Okay. okay. Mark. Mark Christian, I'm at a butter and. So I'm not affiliated with the Conservation Commission on this. And Jane, I will say you've, it's been accurate. Um, I first got involved with you in this project in November when things began to escalate. And you did come and get the water that was killing my trees. And that's all been on the up and up. But what I will say, I've been watching this and the planning board. And after the planning board, the very next day, the big billboard that said phase one, phase two, and phase three was taken down because this work was supposed to be done at the completion of phase one. Now we're into three. It's been 15 years that this has not been done. So yes, things are happening, but more it was kind of like, we have to get rid of this. Here's living proof of how far behind this project is. And <clears throat> more of my... Uh, disagreement with what's going on is not on the conservation end, it's more at the planning. When the rock crusher came in and, you know, um, watching these meetings that material is not being sold, it's not, it's a whole different side of it than what we have here tonight. Um, so that's pretty much what I have to say about the conservation end of it. Uh, thank you. Many things were said at the planning board. Um, one of the things was the drainage issue, which we have a temporary solution only. And again, the permanent solution is going to be that catch basin that will be installed uh, prior to 12 31 2024, which is the permanent solution. Uh, all the material uh, that he referred to uh, that's being stockpiled at the end where the cul de sac is. It's, uh, it's blasted material, it's crushed material, it's loom, et cetera, that, has, that, that, that was part of the um, excavation in getting to the design grades uh, that are shown on the approved plans. And, and she's trying to get rid of the material as we speak. She's contacted many people. She's not doing a mining operation. She's trying to get rid of the excess material that resulted from getting the site down to the proposed grades that were approved, right? It's probably a, a mining operation to get it there because blasting is occurring and hammering is occurring, but this is not a, a mining operation that was approved. It's a trailer park uh, a development that was approved, and that's what happens when you have existing grades and proposed grades. So as soon as she can get that material off site, she wants to, and that's gonna move the project along so we can get the utilities in. Right, but it is going to other places. No, so it has to, it has to. And and I found it laughable to watch a planning board meeting and they know that they're overweight trucks going over a bridge, so they're overweight. Can you imagine those trucks at that rotary at Wind Road when the high school lets out? On a recorded meeting, the city says the abutters are going to police that action. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> No liability there. Yeah, so again, uh, when these things are brought up, we write them down and we and we convey them to the contractors that are on site. That's the best I can do. That's the only thing I can do. Um, the DPW was put on notice, I believe, that this was going on, and I believe the planning board said, uh, I think the state police were gonna be notified so that these trucks are on notice. If they're overweight, they might get pulled over, and there's consequences. So we followed through with that. Is that the best we can do? That's but all he, I can do. He, he did say the abutters <laughs> I, can't I, can't. Are you kidding? I, I don't want the abutters to police that, but you know, it is what it is. Everybody's been made aware of the situation and we're trying to do the best we can to move this forward and get it done. There's a couple of, um, well, there are both uh, Councilor Fleming and Joanne that had their hands raised. So I think, or which, whichever you want to uh, go for. If it's okay, we'll just deal uh, with the virtual uh, attendees first and then we'll go to okay. So. Uh, Either, uh, Joanne or Marissa, um, I 
think you are unmuted, so just. Um, this is Joanne. I was just going to address Mark's question about the signs. We took the signs down because I ordered new signs, and they just haven't come up yet. It had nothing to do with any of the meetings. That's not a big deal either way. But that's all. Thanks for stating that uh, for, for the record, I suppose. Uh, and who else was there, Mike? Um, Marissa Fleming. Uh, Marissa, uh, Councillor Fleming. Hi, how are you? We're good, um, we're good. I, this may be none of my business, but um, you know, there's always rumors and you always have to pay attention to the rumors. And things that I've heard is the reason this project is not progressing as quickly as it should is their funding really isn't there. That in order for a new home to be placed, they have to sell a home. So that is the reason why this project has been so slow to finish. Am I way off on that thought or? So I, I would, I would that's refer- That's been going on for an awful long time. Yep, so I would, again, I, I don't know what happened in the past, but Joanne's on the, on online. I believe Joanne has ordered several uh, manufactured homes to be delivered this year. Uh, Joanne, if you can hear me, uh, how many homes have you ordered and when are they coming in? I have homes, we had a home just come, I don't know what day it is, today's what, Wednesday, yesterday, and I have another home coming the end of the month. I've got like 10 homes on order, um, just so that we can try to finalize the, you know, completion of the community, which I think if you guys have been out there, I think it looks really nice and the residents love it there. So, you know, we are moving forward and I do have homes on order and, you know, my contractors get paid as they bill me. So there's no, there's no deficit. We're not bankrupt. We are doing things as far as I'm concerned, financially, um, we're being smart about our money and not going in debt over my head so that I would lose the project. So the project is being funded. It might not be as quick as everybody would like, but I am funding it and everything's being paid for on a regular basis. There are no contractors with any outstanding debts. We're financially in a nice the position. The residents love it in the community. If you ask any of the residents well, who live I, there, I mean, they're I very mean, happy. The abutters. the abutters, I should have been more specific to the abutters that have had to live with the project for the past 14 years five of which I've been their counselor and seems to have been one of the biggest problems up in that area. So. I think that I'm, there's always issues whenever there's a construction project with the neighbors and the abutters. Well, I, I believe to a point, but I think 14 years is, is a considerable amount of time for them to have to live with it. Go, go, go ahead, Jamie. So uh, all, all comments that we're hearing are valid. There's no question about it. The project's been going on for quite some time, but we addressed this issue at length with the planning board to the point we agreed to open the public hearing and uh, put the project in jeopardy because when you do that, um, you never know what permit conditions are going to be issued. So we did that in good faith, allowed all the abutters to speak, and the planning board voted uh, to amend the order of conditions and we and the planning board addressed those issues. So um, although it's been a 14 to 15 year project, uh, it's gonna be completed in three more years, that's it. So it's not going to continue forever. There's an end life to this. Uh, we're here this evening to deal with the wetland issues. There are wetland issues to deal with, happy to talk about those, uh, but we wanna get those done uh, very quickly as well. And we should be able to, quite frankly. I think we have someone uh, from the public who would like to speak on this matter. Uh, go ahead, ma'am. State your name, just for the record, and your address, please and thank you. Mary Ellen Mara Christian, 71 Bennett Road. Thanks, Jamie, for all the updates. I did have a couple things. Um, the notice of intent to me is, is kind of vague, so I can't, you know, you said the wetland replication area will be completed, general cleanup with the buffer zone, which I think you stated tonight, is done. So what is that? It's not, like what is general cleanup within the buffer zone? 
So, okay, just coming yeah, up so the, the general cleanup in the buffer zone. When I went out to the project and walked it, um, What page are we uh, referring to? What page are we referring to? Yeah. Thank you. Did you hear my question? No. Okay. I, I, I'm sorry, excuse me, Jamie. Um, Mike was just saying he didn't hear my question. So what I asked Jamie was um, that I found the notice of intent pretty vague to me because I it we have additional work to be completed. So wetland replication area general cleanup within the buffer zone. And Jamie explained to us tonight, he mentioned that that was done, but I don't know what general cleanup within the buffer zone is. So I just asked him to, if he could just clarify that for us. Yep. Please. So turn to page four of 13. And if you can read, I couldn't on the 11 by 17s, but if you can read uh, where existing uh, proposed unit three, top right. So that's the buffer zone area that I was referring to. And when I walked the site, I saw trash, I saw the uh, construction debris in the buffer zone and some of it in the wetland as well. Um, and I made that uh, aware, I made the contractor and Joanne aware of that. And they immediately cleaned it up. So okay. that's the cleanup I was talking about. <clears throat> okay, I didn't know what cleanup meant. Yeah, and, I, and again, um, I had this conversation with Tim Smith uh, about the three issues that had to be completed and uh, Tim and I were aligned with, re with respect to what we were talking about. Maybe I should have explained it a little bit in more detail. Okay, and the, um, I guess the concern for me, obviously it's the timeline, um, and that you mentioned that the, wetland the violation to the Wetland Protection Act, which has been in violation for a very, very long time, will be done on by 12 31 24 and i just don't think that means that it's a priority to i don't know if it's you or the owner um because being in violation for so long isn't that something that should be done sooner than that um and that's my concern is i don't think it's acceptable just to say all these things are going to be done because to me, it's just not clear. There's no timelines in here. The, the you know, it has uh, a plan for 22, 23, and 24, and it's just, there's no real dates and, and real specifics and details to me. Okay, thanks. So, Marianne DePinto is, again, gonna be visiting the site in June uh, this month, and she's gonna come up with a wetland replication report to be submitted to the CONCOM for review and hopefully approval. The time frame to do the wetland replication, um, it has to be started uh, this fall, right? So the area will have to be uh, graded, excavated, etc. cetera, uh, according to her wetland replication report this fall. And that's site prep so that we can plant uh, in the spring. So that's, the, that's what's going to happen in the spring of 2023. It's gonna be planted, the wetland replication area. Then we, we know the wetland, the wetland Protection Act says it has to be growing two seasons before you can actually certify it's successful. So we fully intend to make sure that happens. So it, it has to be done this fall and it has to be planted in the spring of 2023. That said, if Marianne DePinto feels after she visits the site that the grading and wetland replication area can be prepped and planted this fall, that's what we're going to do. But that's up to her to make that recommendation based upon site conditions. Um, so that's our time frame from the wetland replication process. Okay, so if it's planted in 23 and wetland protection act says it's two years, that's after the date. So that's not too much after the date. So if, if that's the case, what we're going to be doing is asking for a small extension to, to witness the wetland replication. But I think what you're gonna find is, I think you're gonna find it's gonna be fine prior to the issuance of, to, uh, prior to the request 
of a certificate of compliance uh, sometime in November, December. So is there uh, any any other at all uh, from the public? I, I don't think there is. Um, Hal uh, Melanson had his hand up. Uh, um, I apologize. Uh, Hal Melanson, I, uh, comment please if, if yes, you'd like uh, to. Yes, Hal Melanson, uh, 13 Bennett Road. As far as the bond goes, are there other conditions that a bond could cover other than what Mr. Rowe um, spoke about earlier? Um, I, I don't think their feet have been felt, held to the fire since day one for anything, and I don't believe there was any performance bond from day one. I may be wrong about that, but I don't think so. So, is there, are there any other conditions that a bond could actually give some motivation? So, I mentioned the bond uh, in the very beginning for a very specific reason. In the past, when I've dealt with uh, expired uh, orders of conditions with work that hasn't been completed, uh, other commissions have requested that. And so it's a situation where my estimate to construct the wetland replication, and again, it's only, uh, you know, 450 square feet. It's not a lot. If you do the math, it's like 22 by 22. Uh, but when you have to access the site and you have to do some tree cutting and grading and planting, the maximum uh, amount for a bond that should be issued for wetland replication is about $10,000. So again, I offer that to the commission to give the commission confidence that the wetland replication will be completed. Um, I told you when we have to start it. I told you who's gonna be doing the report and I told you when it's gonna be completed. It's either gonna be completed this fall or phase one this fall and phase two in the spring of 2023. So that's when it's going to be done. And um, if you want a bond to be issued for that, we're happy to do it. I discussed this with Joanne earlier and um, she didn't give me any um, negative feedback to it whatsoever. She's willing to do it if necessary. Brian, can I make a comment? Certainly, Joyce. Uh, Mr. Rowe, um, this may help in some respect address Mr. Melanson's question also. It's like, as it relates back to the original order of conditions that were issued by this committee, why were they not completed in the time frame that they should have been before those order of conditions expired? Yep, great question. Um, I'm, an, I'm the engineer of record, right? So um, that, that, question has to be directed to Joanne Hamburg, the applicant. Which she's on, she's right? She's on, she's on. So if Joanne could answer that question, that'd be great. Ms. Hamburg, Hi. can you answer that question? Yep, yeah, I was just waiting for everybody to stop. I didn't want to be rude. The, um, originally when I started the project, I had hired a contractor and that contractor, I ended up having to get rid of. So unfortunately when I, had him removed i um i i took on the project alone, um and i honestly had no idea it needed to be done at a certain time and um nobody you know ever mentioned it at any time um uh, so i i just had no idea there was a time limit to have it done so all I can do is apologize for not knowing, but it's not something that I knew, but it's been brought to my attention and we will do whatever we need to do to take care of it. Now, uh, not to confuse the issue, but the planning, one of the planning board permit that was issued did not have an expiration date. So I think that confused Joanne a little bit as well. And one of the things the planning board did uh, in April is to put an expiration date on the permit. So this is not going to happen in perpetuity. The other thing that happened from my point of view that I had to uh, deal with on many, many projects is we had the Permit Extension Act uh, kick in and that extended everything uh, to a date certain. 
and then there was confusion on what date that was, and then when the pandemic, pandemic came, everything got extended a little bit as well, uh, but I don't think this permit made it to the pandemic either uh, to continue the, the permit. So there was a little confusion with that as well. So to address both Mrs. Christian's uh, point and Mr. Melanson's point, if there is a new order of condition issued on this project, beyond just having an expiration date, should there not be a timeline implemented as part of that order of condition so that there is no question about what needs to be done when and when it needs to be completed? So uh, I did that for the planning board. They requested it, I did it. If you request it, uh, I will do it as well. So no problem at all. Knowing, I knew full well this was not gonna be dealt with tonight, right? So this is probably going to be uh, continued to July, maybe even August, I don't know. Uh, but I'm happy at the next meeting to submit to you a timeline uh, so that we can discuss that as well. And at that, excuse me, at that point, we'll also have the information from Mary Ann, so we'll be able to come up with a better uh, timeline for everybody. If I can just make a point, if I could, Brian. Sure. On the usual, on the signature page of the order conditions, the, us, the standard condition is this order is valid for three years from the date it's issued unless otherwise specified as a special condition pursuant to general conditions number four from the date of issuance. So it, the default is three years. If that kicks it, okay, so let's say that kicks it out to the summer of 20, uh, what are we now, 25. That goes over what the, the time limit that the planning board, just put a time limit that matches the, the planning boards. A line board. Or, yeah. yeah. If you don't want it to hang until the summer of 25. No. Or what? But maybe not even a time limit, per se, for the entire scope. But if it's the wetlands replication, that needs to be done by March of 23. And I'm just throwing dates out there. And then the stormwater management, different parts of that project need to be done by August of 23 or January of 24. So it details out so that there is no confusion then going forward when things are expected to be done for and, both the and abutters and for Mr. Rowe and Ms. Hamburg. And the commission has the ability to include those in, as special conditions. Yeah. Again, happy to give you a, a written timeline for your consideration at the next meeting, and it can be uh, amended uh, you know, cooperatively between all parties. Go ahead, Mike. I, thank you. <clears throat> I just want to say the, the acoustics of the room and my own personal acoustics uh, only allow me to hear half of what everybody's saying. But uh, I, I wanted to narrow down a couple of things. Uh, you're looking for an order of conditions. We already gave you one, and, uh, and, and you're simply looking for another one. And um, we're only asking for what you agreed and the applicant agreed to in 2006, 2016. Um, in terms of timeliness, I, that's what I wanted to deal with time, replication, and remediation. Uh, and I want to narrow it right down. Um, with regard to time, 2006, we got the bridge in. 2016, we came with uh, additional development. Um, you said June 17th, you're going to meet with the replication, uh, uh, replication area for the wetlands on June 17. Um, start the replication in the fall, plant in the spring, and you'll be finished the whole shebang by December 31, 2024. Those are all the dates I got to address timeliness. Um, there's nothing that would stop them from completing the replication area once uh, we receive a replication plan. Um, the fall that was chosen, you, you need that much time to start. And, and plant in the spring. So the timeliness of that replication, frankly, this Conservation Commission member, in order to entertain extending the order of condition, the, 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 the replication area is first. Get it done. Um, almost prior to entertaining the uh, order of condition. 
Well, we can't do any construction without an order of conditions, right? The, order, the, the original order of conditions has expired, mm -hmm. and the wetland replication that we're proposing on the original plans is in the buffer zone, yeah. so we need a permit to do that work, right? So that's why we're here. Um, wetland replication um, is not recommended to be done June, July, August, September. It's just a bad time to do it. If you want a successful wetland replication area uh, to be successful in growing so that it's functional, again, I just went through this with my own house, right, with DEP. I prepped everything in the fall and I planted everything in the spring and everything is fantastic, right? So uh, Marianne DePinto did my report approved by DEP and I'm following the same guidelines with you. Now, do you want, if, if you issue the order of conditions in August and say, Jamie, this project ha requires wetland replication to be started in August, that's what we'll do. That's not my recommendation, but that's what we'll do. Happy to do that. My recommendations to the commission are objective, not subjective, meaning I want it to be successful. In 35 years of doing this, we start in the fall, we plant in the spring. That's what I've done. So we have the time to do that, let's do it right. If you want it in August and the commission votes on that, that's what it'll be. I, I refer, <clears throat> I, I gave you several dates um, in your replication page that you referred to, um, you said the sequence of replication. It didn't, inc what we're looking for is a sequence. Right. Um, and, and we want that part of the order of conditions. So that, that said, the wetland replication sequence that you have on the plan was originally approved by the commission. We can't follow that sequence. Uh, and I, and I thought I explained this earlier. So in the very beginning, when the project was approved and they did the wetland filling, prior to the wetland filling, what you do normally, and it's on the plan, is you scoop out and excavate the hydric soil, right? You. you scoop out the hydric soil, you stockpile it, and you reserve it for the wetland replication area. That wasn't done. That's not the only way to replicate a wetland, so we'll go to plan B. Plan B is going to do it a little bit differently, but it's just as successful. So we're not gonna utilize the existing hydric soils that we should have scooped out. We're gonna do it a little bit differently. That's why Mary Ann DePinto is being pulled in. Um, and again, with respect to timeframes, I'm happy to do it whenever you want it done. But I will give you my recommendation so that it is successful and my recommendation will be in writing at the next meeting and we can talk about it. Happy to do it when you want. My recommendation is prep it in the fall, plant it in the spring. It's gonna give it a better success rate. But I have done wetland replication areas all in the fall and they've turned out okay. Um, so if that's what you want, that's what we'll try. Happy to do it. Thank, thank you. Um, <clears throat> And next, next was uh, uh, remediation, and this is relative to the North North uh, Planning Board issue, uh, the remediation of uh, water onto an abutting property. Um, while it may be Planning Board, um, you're looking for, you're looking for an order of conditions from us on the wetlands uh, without addressing that. Um, I, I think it ought to be addressed, and, and we'll address, I, I choose to address it here. Um, you know, when the state used my land to do their project, uh, they requested an easement and they paid for an easement. And I'm wondering if, you know, uh, renting land, an abutter's land to store uh, uh, drainage has been entertained. And on the downside of that, um, water going onto another property probably drowns a good deal of vegetation. Um, good or bad, I don't know, I can't say, but have you entertained uh, getting an easement to store surplus water? Um, and, and if not, you consider it, but remediate that uh, post haste. Um, if you're asking for something for us, from us, uh, can you give us that? that? So it may be a planning board uh, purview, but uh, but so we've we've remediated the the ponding on the abutters property uh, by digging a positive flow trench 
that takes the water away from that area, puts it onto our property. If you go take a look at the topography on the site, the topography runoff, the sheet flow, is coming from the abutters property to this low point on our property. And the problem is our contractor stockpiled uh, fill and loom to block that flow of water so it's ponding, right? So bottom line is we alleviated that. That's all done. It's not going to be ponding anymore. But more importantly, the permanent solution is uh, on the plan, it was identified back in 2006, 2007, when it was approved, there's going to be a catch basin installed there. So it will never pond again. And that catch basin is going to be installed very shortly. The con this Conservation Commission member is looking for a permanent solution and not necessarily a temporary. And then um, earlier, uh, for the delay of the project, the, the presence or the absence of manufactured homes has little to do with the shortcomings of the previously issued order of condition. Um, so we're not looking for houses, we're not looking for vacant lots, but we're looking for performance. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, the performance can take place absent manufactured houses, um, and and I, and I guess that's what we're after. We're looking for performance too. Yeah. We want this done. Um, yep. I was I was hurt to hear that December 31 and 2024 was a completion date, uh, particularly for our interests. Um, I, I don't think ours are. I don't think the Conservation Commission interests would take that long. No, Maybe won't. the development will, but I, I'm not looking at the development. I'm looking at our selfish interests. No, the, the, the Conservation Commission issues, and I don't want to minimize them. They're, they're very minimal in construction effort, right? So, uh, again, there's only, there's only three things that I identified. Tim was aligned with the, with the comments that I made, um, and he responded that uh, to Tracy, Mike, and myself via email, so I have it. Um, the three things, wetland replication, like I said, that's going to be done this fall, right? Uh, if the planting has to be done this fall for whatever reason, we're going to do our best. If not, and you follow maybe a recommendation of Mary Ann or myself, we'll do it in the spring. That, it's going to be short term. The stormwater basin has already been installed. There has to be tweaks to it. The four bay has to be installed. We have to lumen seed and hydro seed, et cetera. So there are certain things that have to be done, but the basin is in, right? The riprap swale exits the basin, and we have to put some additional riprap there. It's not a lot of work. It's not, so when I give you a written timeline in July, we can talk about every specific issue that's on there, and we can talk about a timeline to complete. Good. It's not going to take uh, until December 31st, 2024, to take care of the Conservation Commission issues. It's not. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Go ahead, Mark. I just have one quick point. When I first met you, wetlands replication or the absence thereof. Yep. Tim Smith made that quite clear then. In January and February, we talked about having Mr. Pinto come out and look, but we had to wait till the ground thawed. So we were aware of this. Now she's not gonna be there till, Jan till June 17th. We knew this in November. We talked about it here in January and February. Now she's coming in June to start the fall to plant next spring. We knew this a year ago. So again, so what I, it's just typical. It's not typical. Have. So that's why I started my presentation with exactly what took place, and I'm not minimizing your concerns. I agree with your concerns, believe it or not. But I, I started off my presentation by saying I came here first, and we had a conversation. And the conversation centered on more planning board issues than conservation issues at that point. So I decided myself to go deal with those issues right away. And we went to the planning board. And we could deal with those issues with the planning board because it was winter time. And we can go through the process with them. And that's exactly what we did. Uh, now, the day after I finished the planning board, um, the public hearing and the vote, like I said, I emailed the commission the next day. I didn't wait. And I told them exactly what happened, and I told them exactly what we were going to do. Um, and then I submitted the notice of intent. I caught, and again, this, the, this is complete. But because we have to go to a plan B, so to speak, because it wasn't done correctly the first time, we're getting Mary Ann Pinto involved with the wetland replication. Is it really going to matter if it's, at this point, 
considering everything that's happened, it really doesn't matter. It's gonna get taken care of as a part of this application. Um, so although I agree with you, it's gonna be taken care of. That's all I can tell you. I'm not minimizing that. I had to deal with those issues first. Uh, C Commissioner Helene or Commissioner Baker at, at this, uh, I know we haven't heard anything uh, from you, you two regarding this, if you have a comment. My hand's been raised for quite a while. Um, I don't know if this is a significant issue or not, but if you look at the notice of intent, um, I have to actually go to it to find the, um, the particular uh, provision that I'm bringing up. Um, it's in uh, 7B. Uh, there's a place where it says, uh, check why the project is exempt from the um, Mass DEP stormwater uh, provisions. And under that, there's no boxes checked whatsoever. And besides which, it doesn't seem like any of the, the boxes that are provided would apply to this project. So I'm not really uh, certain, um, you know, what what they should have done. This is you, you under, that, Jamie, under other applicable seven. standards, other applicable standards and requirements, number seven, C7, is this project subject to provisions of the Mass DEP stormwater management standards? Yes is not checked, no is checked, then it says, check why the project is exempt and nothing is checked. Again, we filed, we filed a notice of intent, received an order of conditions for a project that included stormwater management. Um, it complied with the, with the stormwater management um, section of the notice of intent back in 2006, and it was constructed uh, according to the approved plans. We're here well, this it evening. Seems, seems like then, Jamie. It seems like you should have checked off yes. It, it, so w when it comes right down to it, this type of scenario is very difficult to include within the notice of intent because it really wasn't envisioned when notice of intents were installed uh, or were uh, were prepared. So we had a conversation in the office on how to fill it out, and we sent it to DEP and we sent it to the Conservation Commission. Our intention is, regardless of what's shown on the notice of intent, our intention is to finish the stormwater management according to the approved plans. And the approved plans meet the, the, uh, the, the section of uh, DEP stormwater management rules. Okay, thank you. Any others? Hands up. Okay, so I, I don't know if we have any other comments, uh, Ms. Christensen. We seem a little scattered on this issue. That's for sure. A lot of moving pieces. Um, well, does the Commission want another um, site walk or add that to um, June twenty second? I think we'll have enough. I look forward time. to a remediation plan by then. We'll have it. Yeah. Yeah. I would like to see a remediation plan as soon as possible. We can't really talk much more without a remediation plan to approve. Um, I think that this whole project is pretty unfortunate for the neighbors, for the violations, and I'm quite frankly shocked that it's been pushed out to 2024. I mean, I'm hoping that, and I know, you know, the weather and all of that is a factor in the remediation and what we have to do. Um, but hopefully the commission stands behind trying to get this resolved as soon as possible and moving forward with our piece, um, you know, for the sanity of the neighbors, especially. One, one question, um, when you say remediation plan, you're referring to a replication plan? I'm sorry, yes, I am, replication plan. Yeah. Tim, uh, our agent, uh, uh, 
asked us if he wanted to uh, initiate an order of conditions. And I would uh, respectfully request that he work with the uh, engineer on the replication plan prior to uh, uh, next meeting. So um, I, I reached out to Tim uh, prior to filing the notice of intent and told him about the alternative way to replicate wetlands in this situation. And we both agreed to discuss it before tonight's meeting and we didn't, my, my bad, right? So uh, I reached out to him today actually, a text message which, which uh, he must be busy but I plan on giving him a call and go, going over this with him so he understands it and getting his input. Yep, so I, I did reach out. Redirecting Tim's offer to the remediation plan would be uh, my interest. Yeah, me too, after we've talked all this out, I'm, I feel the same way. Replication. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, I, I, when we say replication, um, th there's an alternative way to do it. Um, I will be honest with the commission and tell you that I, I'm building a house in Petersham and um, I filled a wetland and I culverted a brook to get to the buildable portion. And you know, in Petersham, that, that's a class A water, right? That water flows into the Quabbin. So they take it very seriously. So I worked eight months to do this wetland replication plan for water quality certification with DEP. And I've been doing this for 35 years and I learned a lot, right? So the DEP person I dealt with um, in the Western region has, an, uh, has a different way of looking at wetland replication, which I'm going to be applying to this project. And that's what I explained to Tim. That's why I think it's gonna be more successful doing it this way than the traditional way we've been doing it. Uh, in the traditional way, on our plans and every other plan you see, you get in there, you clear cut, and you excavate, and you bring it down. And all the trees that are 100 years old and 100 feet high with the canopies, they get cut down. But in the new way of doing it that the Western region has enacted, um, those trees remain. And that's what I'm gonna be trying to do with Mary Ann. Mary Ann and I work together with DEP Western Region to do this for my, and I wanna apply it here. So that's why I reached out to Tim to go over this, a different way of doing it, and I think it's gonna be more successful. Oh yeah, they already have, they already have, yep. Because they still need, just for the record, they still need to issue the a DEP file number, which we don't have. So the commission couldn't take a vote tonight. Which really. we probably won't have for two or three months. It, they're backed up. They're just back, mm -hmm. backed up. So um, I will be, I already emailed them saying there's a public hearing tonight and I'll email them in a couple of weeks. Hey, we have one coming up in July. If it doesn't happen by then, I'll email them again. We have one coming up in August. That's all I can do. But they, once you email them a few times, they're very responsive. They're, they're pretty good. And uh, if we could just request to have that uh, remediation plan. Replication. The uh, replication plan, sorry. Yep. Seven to 10 days ahead of the meeting that would, you know, accommodate us best. I will do my very best. Yep, and I'll keep you informed. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna make a motion uh, based on uh, kind of the circumstances we, we came to conclusion. Um, how should I wear this again? I'm sorry, there's a lot of detail on this one. Well, you want the replication plan yep. um, submitted seven to 10 days prior to the July. Motion to continue the meeting, the public hearing until our next scheduled meeting. Is there anything else the commission members want in advance of that besides the replication? Again, se se sequence of events. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Thanks, Ralph. Yep. Call the roll call here. Uh, Commissioner Helene? Aye. Commissioner Baker? Aye. Commissioner Donnelly? Aye. Commissioner Bro, votes in favor, aye. Thanks, Jamie. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Thank you, folks. Are we doing a site walk again or no, or did we just kind of go over that? We well, didn't, we didn't you, ask for one, we didn't schedule one. Okay. And, uh, just let me know. Okay, no, it's fine. 
Well, if we're visiting um, Crocker Field, I mean, how long could Crocker Field take? And, you know, an hour maybe? And then after, there's still going to be enough daylight to head out Ringe Road. Yeah. No, I mean, it's a, we just kind of talked about it that we didn't clarify whether or not we were actually going to do it. So if we do, I want to make sure it's on my calendar. That's all. So whatever anybody wants to do. Actually, just let, let's see how it goes on the evening of the um, the twenty second. I mean, we have enough time. There's still enough light. It's not too far to get go up Green's Road to the site. It would be nice if we could meet you there if you're going to go. Right. We'll give you and Jamie a heads up. What day? What day are you thinking for the site walk so I can put it in my calendar? It would be the twenty second of Wednesday uh, yeah. uh, of June, a Wednesday. Wednesday. They're starting at six over at Crocker Field. On calm. So it would at least be probably 7 or, or 7.15 by the time our group was to 7 PM. theoretically get over there. Yeah. Ish. Yep. Right. Perfect. I can send you a note when, when we're on the way. Yep. Yep. Fantastic. It's, uh, it's good to see the Crocker Field getting done. Um, I want to say about four or five years ago, whenever Lenny Laxo mm -hmm. was DPW director, he gave me a call. And a couple other people in the city also called and asked me to donate the existing addition survey uh, for that project. So we did it pro bono for the city. So that when I asked to see the plans, I wanted to see if they referenced Whitman and Bingham, and they did. So I'm glad it's getting done. So everybody have a good night. Yeah, you too, Jamie. Moving on to uh, other business section of our docket. Uh, first on that list, Mike says permit extensions. Any, um, extension permits or certificate of compliance um, as of yet. There's one um, violation that we heard of uh, just recently. If you recall, where did Michael go now? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Lost them. <clears throat> Oh, we still have, okay, that's one. We still have, uh, yeah. if Mary and Helene are still here. Yeah, I'm here. Let's, okay, hey. got it. All right. Then let's okay. go. Yeah, you let's remember John, John um, Harrison's lot on uh, Ashenham Street? I do. That was um, purchased relatively recently. New owner. Um, he must have been made aware of the, the conditions that the commission had. But from a nearby abutter, we hear that there has been cutting within the no-touch zone, if you recall. Actually, that's a violation notice I have ready to pass around and, and sign, and we'll get it out to them. But to the, if, you, if you folks recall, to the right of the proposed dwelling at 414 Ashraham Street. And sorry, I don't have this on the screen, um, Ralph and, and Mary Jo, but you remember the, the plan, I believe. This is that small. 5,000 square foot lot with the intermittent stream running down the right hand almost boundary. There was a 20 or 25 foot um, no touch zone just to the right of the um, proposed dwelling. Well, the dwelling is built now. So there has been some removal of trees in there. And um, yeah, so I think a violation notice would be in order uh, to send to the new owner. Okay. Who only purchased it. Uh, February. So relatively Michael, up to speed. Relatively Remember, new owners stepping into a violation. Notice. Harrison's on uh, Ashmanham Street. New owner, already new owner is cutting a bit of the vegetation in here. Mm -hmm. uh, excuse me. You say a new owner, not the builder. New the second owner. Second owner. Hey, Mike, this is Nick Erickson here. We've also got reports okay. that there's some Sorry. paving equipment there and there might be some paving occurring. Um, I haven't checked it out myself, but one of the neighbors across the street called Ryan to alert him that that was going on. So uh, just a heads up. Wasn't uh, as of this afternoon paved. I believe there was talked about having that remain as as gravel or stone dust the dry uh, driveway right so yeah so if you folks are in agreement I have that um, with the yeah I think the next page of that is has space for signatures 
violation notice and an invitation. Is that what this is? Yep. Wait, is that the right? It's the right one. That's when that's when they gave. Right. Well, Only this well, time. Let's let's. Uh, let's uh, uh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> And other than that, um, I don't know if any commission members have other business. Oh, I, there was one. Um, not to put associate member Joyce on the spot, but so. Ashman Ham Street, you, your neighborhood. Yeah. Single family home. Yeah. You know the one they tucked in? Oh, wait, so much. Is, uh, yep. Yep, yep. He had this much to the wetland. Yep. And he's gone in and started cutting the second owner. The guy's owned it for months. He sold it. The new owner went in and started cutting. And um, Ralph had wanted to have some time to talk about the uh, forest um, program that's coming up at the end of this month. And, yeah, maybe that's right. Let him. Yes, I would. Michael. Guaranteed will be approved. Go ahead, Ralph. Yes, as I told you at the last meeting, um, we discovered when looking at all the forest cutting plans that have been submitted to. Uh, PCR and that we get a chance to review for only 10, ten days, that um, there's a, a big uptick in the amount of forest cutting going on by private landowners in Fitchburg um, within the last two, three years, uh, totals about 500 acres of forest land that will have been cut. And uh, this includes some of the familiar ones that we have seen, such as Denouville, um, but also other other parcels that we may not be aware of, and ones that are pretty largely going to going to be cut soon, like uh, on the Westminster Realty site over uh, on Parker Hill, up above Game On. So I proposed that we uh, try to educate the public um, and reach out to them. We've put together a notice. We've got two speakers lined up. Um, Chris Capone, who's the DCR service forester for Northern Worcester County, who took over for Mike Downey, and Mike's been moved to some other part of the state. And Chris is used to giving these uh, uh, town hall forums, he calls them. Uh, in our case, it'll be at City Hall in the, in the third floor conference room, 7 o'clock on June 27th. And the second speaker will be Professor Susan Messino who's a specialist in forest protection and um, can, I think, uh, do a good job of complimenting what Chris will offer. Um, I'd like to encourage everybody to um, uh, make sure that the word gets out about this notice. And, and of course, we need, uh, I was talking to Mike this afternoon. Uh, uh, in um, well, Berlin, right. <laughs> um, you got it. Um, Herlin needs to um, uh, assist in kind of dressing up the the notice. But other than that, it's ready to get mailed out to all all private landowners in the city that have. I think we decided more than ten acres, if I remember right. And also, mm -hmm. we'll put it up on you know social media and and the usual places that the city publishes this stuff and send it out to our colleagues so that there'll be a good attendance and uh, hopefully we'll reach some people and give them some ideas of what else they can do besides just signing on the dotted line of a contract that a logger presents to them, which is, seems to be what's often going on, not necessarily in the interest of the landowner. <coughs> so that's all. Ralph, I take it you'll circulate a final version of the notice to, uh, by I, I certainly will yeah. but I'm waiting first for uh, planning and community development to finish doing dressing it up because it's it's it was all text when I right. last saw it and put a, a bow on the final version yeah we need to make it attractive and 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 um, appealing to people and hopefully we'll get a good audience okay to Ralph's point this is Folder is just the recent cutting plans that we've received in the past maybe 18 months. Looks as though it There's holds some weight over there. And a lot of it's being done by one certain logger, and 
being advised by one certain um, forester. Back in the day, uh, it was so. a little funnel. We didn't have uh, the infrastructure that we funnel had. approach to. Yeah, a market, marketing job looks like, but I, I don't know that for, for a fact. And it's, it's good that our early findings have I even identified um, you know, the correlation there. So, I don't know if anyone else has anything else. Um, I think uh, I'm going to have a, a motion to adjourn uh, our Wednesday, first day of June 2022 Conservation Commission for the City of Fitchburg. So moved. Call the roll. Commissioner Helene? Aye. Commissioner Baker? Aye. Commissioner Donnelly? Aye. Commissioner Christensen? Aye. Commissioner Bro? Aye. Thank you all who joined us. Thanks.